Hello, Board Game Brothers and Sisters. I'm Adam Singer, and welcome to another episode where I'll be letting you know of all the board games launching on Kickstarter and GameFound over the next week. And if you're new to the channel, we do this every week going over all the upcoming campaigns, but before we get into the campaigns, I do like to go over some new announcements and discoveries that I just found out about, but there wasn't really too much to go over this week, so I think we can just skip over that this time around. But as usual, be sure to check out Board Game Co. if you haven't already. I go over these games every single week, but Alex puts out a video at the start of each month going over the entire month. And he also puts out videos every single day going over all sorts of crowdfunding campaigns, giving you reviews, previews, and a ton of other content. So definitely check him out if you haven't already, and I have a link to his channel in the description below. But we do have something like 17 games launching this week, so we do have a really heavy week, so I really do want to jump into it, so let's check him out. And the first campaign we have launches on June 12th, and this one's called Quattro City The Puzzle Quest. And this one plays as many players as you would like and takes as much time as you want to put into it. Because this game is actually mainly a puzzle, but it has a few mechanisms on top of it that make it a little bit more than just your typical puzzle. The way this game works is that players will be opening up different envelopes as they're completing the puzzle, and these envelopes are going to be giving you some sort of clue for mysteries that you're going to be trying to solve as you complete the puzzle. There's going to be clues within the envelopes themselves, but then of course you're going to be putting together the pieces of the puzzle, and then also inspecting those puzzles for more clues that will help you solve whatever it is that you're trying to solve within that envelope. But the way that this is all tied together is by using an app. So you're going to be downloading an app on your phone, and then within the envelope there's going to be different questions where you'll be able to scan those QR codes. Then you'll be working with that app, putting in details as you discover them to get more information and hopefully eventually solving those quests. And if this one sounds interesting to you, you can check it out. I have links in the description below. And if you follow along, you'll get a free gift added to your pledge, which is going to be a set of 14 3D characters. You'll be able to put these around on the puzzle in order to visualize different events that are going on. Also launching on June 12th, we have the Find the Fun campaign, and this one's being run by Gabe Brett, who also runs one of the biggest board game design Facebook groups, and he also has designed a few games himself, and he's also put out a ton of content and books already covering board game design as well as manufacturing and delivery so that you can get your games out to the public. And this campaign is offering a bundle of everything that you need to get started in that ecosystem. So this is going to be offering you a book as well as an online course, but it's also going to be providing you a game as well that that will give you some examples of the different concepts that he's applying. And like I said, he has published a few games already and he's been working in the space for quite a long time, so I do think he has a ton of very useful information. So if you are interested in designing a game or if you have some ideas that you want to work on, this is a great resource to start turning those ideas into action and starting to learn more about how to play test and how to actually get a final product. And if so, I would love to cover your game in an upcoming video. So if you are interested in this one, definitely check it out. And there are links in the description below. And launching on June 13th, we have Fairies and Magical Creatures. This plays two to four players and takes about 30 to 60 minutes to play. And if you're looking for a game that is really easy to learn, but then has a lot of fun decisions, I think this is definitely one that you want to check out because this one has area control, tile placement, and deck building. Each player starts with the same four cards at the start of the game, and you're going to be using these cards to take advantage of different abilities or special bonus actions that you'll be able to apply in order to augment your turn. Players will be able to draft more of these from a shared supply into their deck throughout the game, but like I said, this is also a tile placement game, and in order to gain new tiles, they'll also be drafting those from a shared supply, and the whole concept here is that each player is going to be building up their own garden throughout the game, you're going to be placing both flower tiles as well as path tiles in order to help you score more victory points. And the way that this game works is that each player is going to be alternating taking a turn and when it is their turn they get to decide the action that they're going to be taking. There's a few different actions that you can choose from and I'll get back to those in a second here but the important thing to note here is that whichever action that you choose every player gets to also take that action after you. But the nice thing for you is that as the lead player, you also get to play a card either before or after the action when you take it. So that does give you a slight advantage. And the different actions available to you are to draft a new card into your deck or to play an additional card on your turn. And like I said, this is a deck building game. So whenever you play a card, it's going to be going into your discard pile and you do have an action in order to recycle that and turn your discard pile back into your draw pile. And in order to build out your garden, there is an action for that in order to draft garden tiles. And these are going to come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And these are double sided with either flowers on one side or a path on the other. And if you're placing the flower side up, then you can place it anywhere you want on your board. But if it's a path, it has to start on the edge of your board. And then any path that you place after that has to connect to an existing path. 
The difference between these tiles is that only the flowers are going to be gaining you victory points, but the only way to unlock their victory points is to have them touching an adjacent path. And the final action you can perform is to gain influence in one of the different areas out on the main board by placing some of your influence cubes there. And this is a really interesting aspect of the game because of the way it scores. Players are going to be placing their cubes into these different areas, but then the player that has the most cubes there is going to be gaining points equal to the total number of cubes in that area. So that means not only are you going to be gaining points for your cubes, but you're also going to be gaining them for any of your opponents. If you're second place, you're going to be getting points equal to the number of cubes that you can contributed but if you don't come first or second you're not going to be getting any points from that area so you don't really want to be contributing cubes to that area but whichever player is able to get 10 cubes first into any of these areas is going to be gaining the special fairy token which they'll be able to put onto their garden which is going to give them some special bonuses at the end of the game the player with the most total victory points wins the game and if you're interested in this one you can check it out i have links in the description below also on the 13th, we have Castellans of Valeria, and this plays 1-5 to five players and takes about 60-90 to 90 minutes to play, and this one is my own personal pick of the week. And the reason that I'm picking this one is that the rule set on this one is not too complicated, but I think it offers quite a lot of game, but also has a lot of mechanisms that I personally really love. It has dice drafting, which for whatever reason is one of my absolute favorite mechanisms, but it also has area control, but I really love the way that the area control works in this game because for each unit that you're going to be putting out on the board, you're going to be opening up an area on your own personal player board that's going to be giving you tons and tons of bonuses, creating a bit of an engine as the game goes on. It also has variable and ongoing scoring throughout the game. And what I mean by that is that each round you're gonna be scoring different regions of the board, which means you have to change your strategy a little bit from round to round, but then you're also gaining victory points each and every round, which is something that I'm a big fan of. I'm okay with all types of scoring in games, but if I can choose between scoring everything at the end and ongoing scoring, I do always prefer the ongoing scoring because it's nice to know how you're doing relative to the other players and to sometimes feel like you're the underdog making a big come back at the end of the game. But the way this game works is that players are going to be placing structures and people in two six districts out on the main board. Each building behaves a little bit differently, but it can also behave differently depending on which district you put that building into. As you place out these buildings, it's going to be moving you up different influence tracks that can gain you bonuses throughout the game. And like I said, each round you're going to be scoring a different district on the map, which is going to be changing your focus throughout the game. But there are some buildings that work outside of this rule and can score each and every round. And these buildings can even have added layers on top of them, like scoring each round for how many people or specific structures are in the district with that building. Or they could even gain you influence in adjacent districts. But each round, a number of dice are going to be rolled, and then players are going to be drafting from those dice. Whenever you draft a die, you're going to be gaining the resource depicted on that die, but then you'll also be able to spend that die to perform actions on your board. The nice thing about this is that the different actions on your board can also have different iconography, and if that iconography matches the icon on the die as well, that will give you some additional bonuses for performing that action with that specific die. And these actions are going to allow you to purchase and place all these different structures or people out on the main map. But the nice thing about whenever you do that is when you take one of the structures off of your board, you're actually going to be unlocking the ability that is depicted below it. Some of these abilities might be available to you just by putting out that single unit, while others might require you to put multiple units out before that ability is completely unlocked. Another thing that placing units out on the board can allow you to do is to actually open up different tracks in order to allow you to hold more resources throughout the game. But aside from placing units, you can also use those actions to buy cards which can give you some instant or ongoing effects. And the game continues like this until that final round, and then the player with the most victory points at the end of the game wins the game. And if this one sounds interesting to you, you can definitely go ahead and check it out. I have links in the description below, and you can click to get notified. Also launching on the 13th, we have Stalker the Board Game. This plays 1-4 to four players and takes about 120 to 180 minutes to play. And this one is a cooperative game based on the video game with the same name. And the way this game works is that players are going to be working together throughout a campaign, trying to complete different objectives and goals in order to complete each scenario. 
in order to guide you through each of these scenarios, you're going to be using a main map. And this is going to allow players to choose which direction that they want to go throughout the campaign with each of those locations guiding you to a specific scenario inside of the campaign booklet. This is going to outline some narrative, special rules, and map setup, as well as the goals for that specific scenario. And something that I think is really neat about this, opposed to a lot of other scenario-based campaign games, is that normally you're just using the scenario book to set up that initial state for the scenario and then to understand the goals but in this one you're actually going to be using it throughout the scenario because each round you're going to be turning to the next page and it's going to have some additional steps and events that could happen that can just add a little bit more flair and a little bit more narrative to the scenario as you're playing through it. And another really cool design decision in this game that I'm a huge fan of is the way that the actions work in this game because not only do you have your starting gear and unique abilities and specialties but you also have a unique set of starter action tokens and you'll be able to upgrade these and add more to your supply throughout the game which is really cool because you'll be spending those in order to perform the various actions but depending on which token you spend it's going to change that action just a little bit. And these action tokens come in two different sizes with the larger ones representing a longer action and the smaller ones representing a shorter action. The difference between these is that you can't use a small action token to perform a long action, but you can spend a long action to perform any action. And the way that the rounds work in this game is that you're going to have a player phase and then you're going to have the enemy activation phase. During the player's phase, they're going to be spending their action tokens in order to perform various actions, and you can mix and match the order of the players taking as many or as little actions as you want at a single time. And these different actions are going to allow players to move around on the board, attack enemies, peek into buildings, or discover different cards on the map which can do different things like change the state of the map, reveal information that you might need in order to complete a quest, or they could even cause some different events. And of course there's going to be all sorts of different enemies out on the board but there is also going to be these special anomaly tokens and these are really dangerous for you to interact with but they also can give you some massive rewards. Combat is resolved using dice rolling in this game and as you can see there's a bunch of different dice and a bunch of different colored dice with different colors being more valuable than others because in order to hit an enemy you're going to be trying to get a certain number of pips on your die and if you are above that number of pips then that counts as a hit but there are two types of hits in this game you could either go for a headshot which can be an instant kill or you can go for a body shot which will then allow you to roll a separate set of dice if you manage to land the hit and when you roll those separate dice for a body shot those are going to be indicating how much damage you deal but they could also cause an instant kill as well or a complete miss and if you do enjoy stealth games this game does incorporate a healthy amount of stealth in it as well and there's essentially two things you're gonna to have to worry about there is line of sight of your enemies as well as the noise that you're gonna be making enemies will be able to see in all three directions in front of them and if you're passing through their line of sight or if you're stopping directly within their line of sight that's going to indicate how alert they are of your presence this could cause the enemy to do different things like become interested in the area when it becomes the enemy activation phase but it can also trigger them to attack you during the player's phase if you happen to be directly in front of them. Of course enemies do need line of sight and there is a specific range that each enemy can see so you'll also want to be trying to take advantage of that. But each action that you perform can generate some amount of noise some more than others and each time you do that you're going to be putting a noise token on the space where that noise was created. Each noise token added to a specific space is going to expand the radius that that noise can be heard by the enemies and an enemy is going to go and investigate whichever place is the loudest that they are able to hear. The nice thing about this is that it happens on the enemy's activation phase so you do get to wait until all your actions are completed before the enemies are going to be responding to that noise. And during the enemy activation phase you're going to be moving each of those enemies one at a time towards any noise that they're able to hear and if they go face to face with one of your characters of course that's going to trigger a fight we're going to be resolving using the dice rolling like I said before. But if an enemy is unaware of any noise that you caused in your turn they're just going to stay where they are but you are going to be rolling a die for each of the enemies at the end of their activation in order to determine which way that they're going to be facing for the following round. The game continues like this as players perform their actions and try to complete the different objectives and if you're able to complete the final goal of that mission then you have successfully completed it and have won that scenario. And if this one sounds interesting to you you can check it out in the description below and follow along to get notified which will get you an additional character added to the game. Also launching on the 13th we have Thief Dumb and this plays one to four players and takes about one to two hours to play. 
And this one is a simple competitive pickup and deliver board game. The way this game works is that each player is going to be controlling a team of three thieves and players are going to be using all sorts of tools as they move around the city and try to complete different heists while avoiding the various guards that are patrolling the city streets. The way that this game works is that each round players are going to be simultaneously planning the order that they want to activate their three thieves. Players will be simultaneously revealing and then taking turns performing their actions with one of those thieves at a time. These actions will allow you to do different things like move around on the board and then interact with different points of interest or characters that are adjacent to you. You could rob the nobles for their golds and gems, or you could even rob galleries for their valuable artwork. Whatever you are able to acquire, you can also trade with smugglers and merchants out on the board in order to trade those resources for other resources, or to even gain different tool cards to give you some various special abilities. You can also visit taverns to meet characters with special skills in order to gain their character card and gain access to that skill. And you can also visit all sorts of other different locations that will allow for resource conversion in order to convert your resources into the other resources and eventually into victory points. But players aren't only controlling their three thieves because at the end of each round, players are also going to be taking turns moving around the neutral characters out on the board. This includes the guards, carriages, as well as the various nobles. Players are going to be trying to move these different characters in order to create opportunities for themselves and also get in the opponent's way, trying to get them caught by the guards, which will cause them to lose victory points. And of course, the player with the most victory points at the end of the game wins the game. And if you're interested in this one, I have links in the description below. Also on the 13th, we have Cook King, and this plays two to eight players and takes about 20 to 90 minutes to play. And this one is a competitive party game. And the way that this game works is that players are competing to be the first player to complete their kitchen. In order to complete a kitchen, you're gonna have to have some amount of refrigerators, stoves, and completed dinners. There's two types of decks in this game. There's the ingredient deck, which has all sorts of ingredients to complete your dishes, but there are also attack ingredients as well as defense ingredients. The other deck is your equipment deck, which is going to include things like your refrigerators, stoves, and other items that can help you throughout the game. Each player does start the game with one stove, which is going to allow them to perform one action on their turn, and players will each all start with a recipe card, which essentially acts as a player aid, allowing players to know which combinations of ingredients will create which recipes, and which recipe is worth which amount of points. But in each round of this game, players are going to be drawing a number of ingredient cards into their hand, and then you're going to have a certain amount of time to decide what you want to do on your turn. You essentially have two options. You could either use those ingredients to try and complete a dish to score you victory points, or instead you can play one of your attack ingredients. Like I said, each stove allows you to perform one action, so if you have more stoves, that gives you more opportunities to create dishes or play attack cards. Some of the equipment cards can also allow you to do things like store cards away so that you have more options in a future turn and you can combine any two of the same cards together in order to make those two cards act like a wild ingredient in order to give you more flexibility when it comes to completing those recipes. At the end of the round players are going to be resolving their choices and gaining income based on the recipes that they're able to complete but of course if you did have an attack card played on you that could interrupt your recipe but if you do have any defense cards you could try to play those in order to counteract that attack. Players will then want to spend any money that they earned in order to buy more equipment cards for additional actions and abilities on upcoming turns, kind of building a bit of an engine. But you do want to try to spend as much of the money as you can because it does not transfer over to the following round. The game continues like this until one player is able to fully complete their kitchen and then that player wins the game. And if you are interested in this one, you can check it out. I have links in the description below. And also launched on the 13th, we have the 10th anniversary reprint of the game Firefly, the board game, which of course is based on the awesome series with the same name. And if you haven't checked out the series yet, I do recommend it. It is a lot of fun. And although there is only one season before it got canceled for whatever reason, they did end up making a movie as well, which is also an excellent movie and does wrap things up quite well. But this is a game for one to four players and takes about 120 to 240 minutes to play. And there is quite a lot of variability in this game because at the start of the game, you're going to be choosing a ship and a captain, each of them granting you some different skills and abilities, which you can also augment with different gear throughout the game. They're also going to be starting with some starting resources and some starting jobs. But what is really cool here is that your end game objective will change from game to game because you're going to be also choosing a story card at the start of the game, which is going to dictate your goals and your win condition. 
Each round, players are going to be taking turns performing just two actions, and you can't perform the same action twice, so you always have to choose two different actions, but those actions can include just moving one space safely, or instead you could choose to move further by spending a fuel card. The interesting thing about moving this way is that you can move as many spaces as your ship is able, but for each space that you move into, you're going to be drawing a card from one of two decks. These decks can have a bunch of empty space cards that don't do anything, but they're going to also be all sorts of different cards that can cause negative events or negative effects that you're going to have to deal with. But players can also use an action to purchase new gear, crew, or resources, and the options that you'll have available to you do depend on the location that you are currently visiting. And of course, you'll be using all this to complete your various jobs, and like I said, you do start with a starting job, but you can also use an action to gain new job cards into your supply, and the options that you'll have available for the different jobs do also vary depending on your location. Different jobs will have players completing different pickup and deliver objectives, as well as possibly completing different skill checks. Players are going to be assigning different crew members with those different skills to try and heighten their success. And completing a job can grant you money, as well as permanent special abilities, which can make other jobs in the future easier to accomplish. These jobs can also fall into two different categories of being either legal or illegal jobs, and the crew that you assign to them will become disgruntled if their alignment does not match with the morality of those jobs. You do also have to pay your crew for each of the jobs that they complete, and if you are unable to pay them, then that's another thing that can cause them to become more disgruntled. And the more disgruntled your crew members become, the more problems that they can cause in the future. And the collector's edition of this game is going to include everything ever offered for the Firefly game, so that includes all promos and previously released expansions. And it's also going to be adding a new expansion, which is the Still Flying expansion, which is going to be adding new ships and cards to the game. And of course, if you are interested in this one, you can check it out. I have links in the description below. Also launching on the 13th, we have Solar Titans, and this plays 1-4 to four players and takes about 30-60 to 60 minutes to play. And this one is a deck building space combat game where players are going to be building out their own spaceship and attacking the other players. And what's really interesting about this game is that there's actually two different types of cards that you're going to be working with. There are your ship cards and then there are your crew cards. Your ship cards are what you're going to be using to build out your ship, and this is going to come in the form of different weapons with different power and aiming capabilities as well as ways to build up your armor and other cards that can offer all sorts of upgrades and special effects like your crew quarters or even your command center. But each player is going to be choosing a pattern card at the start of the game and this is going to dictate the starting pattern of your ship and you're going to have to use those cards in order to build your ship in that pattern. But as the game goes on you'll be able to purchase more of these to repair damaged areas of your ships or even just add new components to your existing ship. That's pretty much everything you need to know about the ship cards. They only are used to build out your ship. They aren't used for the deck building aspects of this game, but that is where your crew cards come into play. Each player begins the game with a starter deck of crew cards that you'll be able to use and build upon throughout the game. But essentially these cards are gonna be used for two main purposes. One is to either generate money, which you'll be able to spend in order to buy new crew cards, which will go into your discard deck, or you'll be able to spend to purchase more upgrades for your ship. But the other thing they can do is arm the various weapons on your ship, and some crew members are going to be better at this than others, and some weapons are going to require more crew members to power that specific weapon. And then any weapons that were successfully armed will be able to be fired at any point in the future, but of course, as soon as you fire it, you will have to arm it again before it can be used another time. Different weapons can work in different ways, with some of them only being able to hit cards on the outside of the ship, and other cards being able to hit through a complete column of cards. One thing to note is that you are limited in the amount that you can repair and upgrade your ship, so as the game goes on, you're probably going to want to invest more into the crew cards that can arm your various weapons that you do have, rather than trying to focus on getting more of those different types of weapons. The game continues like this, and the last player standing wins the game, and if you're interested to know more, you can check out the campaign, and I have links in the description below. Also launching on the 13th, we have Phantom Epoch, and this plays 1-4 to four players, it takes about 60-180 to 180 minutes to play, and this one is a cooperative campaign game where players are going to be traveling in the galaxy to try and take out an existential threat. 
Each game players are going to be choosing a scenario from the book, which is going to dictate how the map's set up, as well as the various enemies that you're going to be encountering. And then the game plays over a series of rounds, where at the start of each round, you're going to be rolling a decision die, and that's going to come into play in a bunch of different aspects in the game, because there's different cards and events that can happen. And depending on the outcome of that decision die, it's going to change the direction that those go. But each player is going to have their own set of action cards specific to their character, and every round you can play as many action cards as you want, as long as the total AP required for those action cards does not exceed the amount of AP available to your character. And although this is a cooperative game, players will be choosing their actions in secret and then revealing them simultaneously and resolving them the best that they can with the actions that everyone ended up choosing. And of course the actions will allow you to do different things like move around on the map, attack enemies, and interact with different points of interest out on the main board. One thing to note is that your action cards are discarded anytime that you use them, and in order to get those action cards back, you need to spend one of your turns performing a rest action. Whenever you do that, you'll get all those cards returned to you, but you'll also recharge any of your used items, and you'll also be able to take that as an opportunity to equip or shuffle around any gear that you might have, and it'll also allow you to heal any negative effects that have accumulated on your character. But before the players can perform their actions, you're going to be drawing two cards for each enemy that is currently out on the board. You're going to be drawing a card for their specific enemy species, as well as the enemy's class. And those are going to combine together in order to determine the initiative of that enemy, as well as the actions that they're going to try and perform. All the characters are then going to be able to perform their actions in their initiative order. That's determined by the cards that the players picked, as well as the cards that were assigned to the enemies. And of course, the characters are going to be trying to perform actions that help them reach their goals, while the enemy are going to be performing different actions that get in their way. As players play throughout the campaign, they're going to be unlocking new items and skills that they'll be able to persist into future scenarios. And if this one sounds interesting to you, you can check it out, and I have links in the description below. Also launching on the 13th, we have Kraken Skulls, and this plays 2-5 to five players and takes about 30-45 to 45 minutes to play. And this one is a pirate-themed game of dice rolling where players are going to be fighting each other, as well as sea monsters and even navy ships. And the way this game works is that you're going to be setting up the main play area by randomly assigning different location cards into a circle into the center of the table. Players are going to be moving around on these cards, choosing in secret whether they want to stay where they are, move clockwise, or move counterclockwise. There's two different types of location cards. There are open sea cards, and then there are the port cards. If two players are ever on the same location and it's an open sea card, then those players are going to engage in battle. And the way that you do that is by dice rolling, where each player is trying to get the most successes on their die in order to be the victor of that battle. Winning a battle gains you a victory point, and the first player to six victory points wins the game. But if instead you meet a player on one of the port cards, then instead of battling, you're going to be engaging in some sort of minigame that is specific to that port. Of course, winning that does still gain you a victory point, but players can also gain different supply cards as well. Supply cards can gain you some special abilities that you can use to your advantage, but they can also gain you gold that you'll be able to use to purchase more dice, which will give you the advantage in any future dice rolls. But the player's ships aren't the only thing out in the open sea because there's going to be a kraken that's moving clockwise across all the open sea cards. And if a player is ever on the same location of that kraken, that's going to also trigger a battle. But the kraken is quite a bit stronger than the ship, so it is better to try and take on the kraken with other pirates in your same location. Battling the kraken works very similar to battling the other ships, but the kraken also has a special die that can cause you to discard one of your dice from your dice pool permanently, so you do have some extra risk here. As the game goes on, players are going to be gaining more victory points, and once a player reaches a certain amount of victory points, that's actually going to trigger the introduction of the navy ship. The navy ship moves from port to port, but its direction is going to be random, so it could be moving clockwise or counterclockwise. And fighting it does work similar to the Kraken, but if you are not up to the task, you'd also try to bribe the ship as well. Of course, there is always the possibility that you'll just end up on a location all by yourself without any threats or danger there. And if that's the case, you have a few options that you can perform. You can either plunder that area in order to gain a new supply card, or instead you can choose to leave any supply cards that you currently have in your hand on that location, and you'll be able to draw an equal amount of cards into your hand. 
Alternatively, if another player already left some cards at that location, you can instead use an action to just pick all those cards up, adding all those cards into your hand, which is a great way to get a ton of extra cards. But this one does come with a little bit of extra risk because there are trap cards as well, and if a player left a trap card in any of those cards, then that's going to have a negative effect on that player. But the game continues like this until a player is the first to gain six points and then that player will win the game and if you want to know more you can check this game out i have links in the description below also launching on the 13th we have paragon's age of champions this plays two to three players and takes about 45 to 75 minutes to play and this one is a competitive card battler that uses drafting as well as deck building and it also incorporates a lot of elements of your classic trading card game but rather than having to buy a bunch of different decks of cards everything is supplied in a single box and like i said depending on what you choose it's going to change your overall style of play for the game but after you've chosen your leader card players are going to be taking turns drafting mercenary cards from the supply at the center of the table these mercenaries are your primary means of combat and they are all unique and have their own advantages so you're going to be trying to pick mercenaries that synergize well with your leader card. If your chosen class was the warrior that's going to allow you to apply all sorts of different buffs to your mercenaries but if you chose the mage that's going to grant you different spells they can use against your opponents and also to manipulate the board. Finally there is the ranger which is going to allow you to gain access to all sorts of different traps and tools to try and put your opponents in a vulnerable state in order to work up to a more calculated attack. I couldn't find too much more info on how combat actually works in this game, but I imagine it'll work very similar to a lot of other card battlers with these unique elements layered on top of it. So if this one does sound interesting to you, you can definitely check it out to learn more and learn more about how exactly it plays. And I have links to the campaign in the description below. Also launching on the 13th, we have Adventure Party, the role-playing party game. And this plays three to eight players. It takes about 30 to 60 minutes to play. And this one looks like a really fun party game, especially for those of you that are a fan of role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons, because in this game, each player is going to be taking the role of a different class, and you're going to be trying to complete three different quests or scenarios. The way this game works is that each player is going to be rolling a d20 in secret, and then they're going to be outlining their plan and what actually happened depending on the value of the die that they rolled. This alternates between all of the players with each of them adding to the story that the previous player told, outlining their perspective and what happened depending on their outcome of the die roll. But the interesting thing about this game is that winning the game does not actually depend on whether or not you're successful in completing the scenario. Instead, you're going to be trying to gain as much points as possible. And the way that you gain points in this game is that there's always going to be one player that's acting as the GM. And they're trying to get the value of the die rolled by each of the other players. And the only information they have is what those players' plans were and what the outcome was based on the results of the die. So if something went really, really well, you might guess it was somewhere near a 20 where if something went very terribly, you're going to be guessing somewhere closer to a 1. You're going to be gaining more points the closer you are to the correct value. And then you're going to be adding up all the points for the three scenarios. And then you're going to be determining how well the team performed based on the total number of points. Of course, there's going to be a bunch of different scenarios offered in this game, making each time you play it quite a lot different than the last. And if you are interested in this one, you can check it out. Links in the description below. Also on the 13th, we have Burning Bridges, and this plays two to six players and takes about an hour to play. And this one is a fantasy-themed tactical war game, and I don't have too much info on how this game actually plays, but I'm sure you're going to be putting units out on the map, and your units are going to be consisting of all sorts of fantasy creatures. The units each have some different stat values, as well as different ranges of attack, and players will be activating their units in order to try and defeat their opponents. Like I said, I don't have a whole lot of info on this one, but I don't see too many war games with a fantasy theme, so if you are a fan of the genre, definitely check this one out, and I'll have links in the description below. And launching on June 15th, we have Inventions Evolution of Ideas. This plays two to four players and takes about 120 to 150 minutes to play. And this one is a competitive worker placement Euro game that is designed by Vitel Lacerda. And if you're not familiar with Lacerda games, I should probably warn you that these can be quite heavy, quite complex, and have quite a lot of rules overhead. But the way that this game works is that each player is going to be trying to make their own impact on the world as inventors. Players are going to be trying to come up with different invention ideas by acquiring idea cards, and then they're going to be choosing a continent to make progress on that invention. Players will also be able to iterate on inventions that other players create in order to improve them, and these are all some different ways to gain victory points. 
Throughout the game, players will be gaining different skills and upgrades, as well as knowledge in the different fields of study that they'll all be tracking on their own player board. Players also have a whole bunch of different worker types that they'll be able to use in various ways in order to make progress on the different inventions. Players will be taking turns using these workers in order to take various actions out on the main board. Players could use an action to put an idea card out on the main map. And the way that this works is that there's a bunch of different areas around the perimeter of the map where you can put in these idea cards with each of those locations being associated with a different continent. Each continent's also going to have randomized tokens that grant you different bonuses depending on the actions that you take there. So these various tokens and which ones most benefit you could dictate which area on the map you want to be putting your efforts in. You'll also want to be choosing which idea cards you want to put out on the board depending on the skills that they require in order to develop because each player is going to be proficient in different skills and putting different idea cards out does kind of set the trajectory of the game and determine what skills are going to be needed as the game develops. So you're going to be trying to put out the cards that most align with you. And of course, there are actions that you can take advantage of at all the different phases of an invention's life cycle. So you have the action to place a new idea, but then you also have actions to create that invention, share it with the world, as well as innovate and improve on it. Players can also use actions to gain knowledge in different fields in order to open up the possibilities of working on some other inventions. And those are the main actions in the game, but there are also actions that allow you to gain influence in the different regions of the world, as well as to move your workers around on the map or to recall them back into your supply. And these are all useful in different ways because anytime that you visit different regions of the world, that can actually gain you culture tokens that you'll be able to use to make different upgrades on your personal player board. But then also having a lot of presence in an area will allow you to interact with the representative of that region, which will essentially allow you to gain certain bonuses or bonus actions for being at that location. But the thing that I like most about this game and the thing that I think makes it special compared to a lot of other worker placement games is that in this game you're actually going to be gaining something called chain tokens and you're going to be gaining more of these the more influence that you gain throughout the game. But essentially you're going to be gaining access to a number of these each and every round depending on your influence and certain actions can be chained into other actions and you're going to be spending those tokens in order to chain those together. Of course, this isn't always an option unless you're using an action that can actually be chained. But another interesting thing with this is that some of these action locations actually have bonus actions only associated with that specific space that are only unlockable if you spend a chain token. So not only can you chain different actions together, these chain tokens can actually unlock different actions and bonus actions that aren't available previously. But chaining actions together is always really fun and trying to figure out the best way to optimize your actions to take advantage of that as much as possible while still completing the actions that you want to try to perform is always a great decision point in a lot of these Euro games. So I think this is a really cool aspect of the game, but at the end of each round, players will also be able to spend any of their money that they've accumulated so far in order to make progress on their different progress tiles that they've added to their own personal player board. And this will allow you to gain additional bonuses throughout the game. Of course, there is a ton more to this game that I'm sure I haven't explained and probably a lot more that I'm not even aware of because like I said, this is a Lacerda game and these do tend to be quite crunchy. But if this one sounds interesting to you based on the info that I've provided so far, feel free to check out the campaign because I'm sure there'll be a lot more info in playthrough videos where you can find out all the nitty gritty details. And of course, you can find links to the campaign in the description below. And also launching on the 15th, we have Thorgal, the role-playing game. And I'm not going to get too much into the details on this one because I don't spend quite as much time on the role-playing games because this is more of a board game focused channel. But the interesting thing about this game is that they did release Thorgal, the board game, just a few weeks back. And if you are a fan of the IP, that game looked like a ton of fun. And now there's the role-playing game option as well. So you have quite a few options of how you want to experience it. But if you're not familiar with the IP, it's all based on a world that was created as part of a set of graphic novels. I don't know too much about it, but if you do want to know more, you can check out the campaign, which I'll have linked in the description below. And if you are interested, check out the board game. The late pledges are still open for that one as well. And those are all the campaigns I have for you this week, but don't leave yet because we still have an awesome giveaway to announce. And this one's going to be for a pledge for the game World Breakers, which if you're not familiar with is a card dueling game where each player is going to have their own World Breaker and deck of cards associated with that World Breaker, where they're going to be drawing from to gain different types of cards in order to use to attack their opponent. A world breaker is a special kind of person that is able to use a specific resource in order to make their abilities stronger. 
players are going to be spending this resource in order to activate the various cards. But then players are also going to be trying to build standing with a bunch of different factions because some of these cards not only require you to spend your resource, but you also need to have a certain standing with that faction. This means that there's going to be a few different aspects that you're trying to manage in order to take full advantage of your cards. And this giveaway is going to be for a copy of the game and all you have to do to enter this giveaway is check out the link to our discord in the description below head over to the giveaways channel and click the little emoji underneath that giveaway that'll get you entered into the giveaway which will be automatically drawn at the end of the following week and just so you know i have all notifications on our discord turned off by default so entering our discord does not opt you into anything and it's not going to get you spammed by a bunch of different notifications but if you do want to get notified anytime that we run a giveaway all you have to do is check out the rules channel and if you click the little emoji with the gift icon that will send you notifications for any time that i run a giveaway on the discord there's also a lot of other notifications you can opt into if you are interested, but like I said, they're all disabled by default. Good luck in the giveaway, but now let's go ahead and draw the winner for last week's giveaway, which was for a pledge for Monsters of Loch Lamond. And to draw a winner, I use this application here. All these extra entries down here are bonus entries for my Patreon subscribers. If you like the sort of content and want to help make all these efforts just a little bit more sustainable for me, I truly do appreciate it. You can find a link in the description below. Let's go ahead and draw those comments and draw a winner and the winner is profit 0007 and this is one of our patreon subscribers so congratulations i'll reach out to you and let you know that you won yourself a pledge for the monsters of Loch lamont and that is everything i have for you this week quite a long episode which means that it's close to 3 a.m now and i still have to do the editing so i'm just going to go ahead and wrap this one up Thanks so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And all I ask in return is that you remember to keep that shelf cluttered and the table full.